flesh off my bones. And I looked at, and I looked at um, Charlotte, and it looked like she was doing like lotus hands, oh. but she's like doing like, come on, like what yeah, really hands? Weird. And so, I was like super worried that she was gonna like kill me. And then I looked, and the door was open, and I was like, oh god, the goblin's gonna get me. Uh, <laughs> you know, speaking of like casts and stuff like that, if you look in that goblin door, uh, there's like a gap between the wall and the brick that like is my actual house. And I'm like, it's not big enough for me to fit back there, but it's big enough for something to fit back there. And it's very spooky. The man who lives in your crawl space. Which just means he's like very skinny, and I Which don't is like that. Even scarier, it's like, like Slender that. Man. Yeah, <laughs> like he like pushes the door open, and like it takes forever for like his foot to come out and go on the ground, and then it's Yuck. like his butt. Oh God, that's when you get in a car. Do you get in head first or butt first? Oh God, um, I think I head first because I've definitely conked my head on the door. And I, or you know what? I think I've tried butt first, and then I've conked. I I don't judge the distance correctly, and I've conked my head on like the frame. Apparently, women get it. You generally get in head first, and men get in butt first. But I get in butt first. I wonder why women get in head first. I don't know. That's interesting. I will tell you, trying to get in butt first, I've hit my head too many times on the door, so I don't do that anymore. I think I do judge it by the head. Yeah, I am, like, awkwardly usually putting something on a seat, sitting my ass down, and then folding my <laughs> head in at the last minute, and then yanking my door closed. I'm essentially getting in the car backwards. <laughs> now I'm going to think about that every time I get in my car. Like, how am I, how am I getting in it? Is it correct? As long as I don't hit my head. These are the things I think about at 3 a.m. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't, if I wake up at 3 a.m., it's usually because my tater tot is awake at 3 a.m. Mama! <laughs> um, so I'm usually thinking, why is this happening right now? Also, it's the devil's hour. Why is this happening? Yeah. Well, I can't get out of bed. If I wake up at 3, I can't get out of bed until 4, because Emily Rose will get me. That's right. And, like, I can't, I have to know where my cat is, because if I hear him and he's, like, crying in the kitchen, I don't trust it. Because that's... <laughs> You're the, like, that's how the demon's get That's you. the demon trying to get me out of bed. Um, so then I just have to lay there with my little nightlight on in the dark until I, like, it's safe to get out of bed. Speaking of nightlights... I read The Ankle Snatcher by Grady Hendrix, and I was like, do nightlights count? I don't know. I don't know. Do they count? I feel like they should. I think so. Because I definitely have a nightlight on for said tater tot, so that's, like, always on, and I'm just like, I've gone pee before, but I don't look in the mirror because of- uh, Oh, you can't look in the mirror. That's how Bloody Mary gets that's you. That's right. As so when you wake up at three to go pee, you have to hold it or you have to turn on the lights and you can't look in the mirror. That's right. Or if I do keep it dark because I just want to sleep, I literally will go like, pew, past the mirror, <laughs> pee, don't look at anything, like wipe, get up, wash my hands, but don't look. I just look down at the sink and wash my hands really quickly and then I like scurry to bed. <laughs> my bathroom has a mirror on the back of the door. Uh, so like you have to like not look anywhere like you just have to be with your eyes closed the whole time <laughs> um which then also makes me think of when i'm closing at work and i go to check the bathroom yeah and you have to like turn off the lights and then that hall mm -hmm. like i have to slap the lights as i'm running <laughs> towards the door and then i like fling it open and it's a heavy fire door so i fling it open and then i do the like <laughs> Spin like when you're running up the stairs and like you have to look to make sure the thing didn't almost get you because I am convinced I'm going to turn around and like a demon thing is going to be like scrambling from the bathrooms after me. So and I know you think of Grady Hendrix and then you told me and I think of Grady Hendrix's horror store when you're closing and opening at work. Yeah. So 
Thank you, Grady Hendrix, for haunting my nightmares with new ideas of ways I'm going to get 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 it. Yeah. I like ran out of there the other day and male coworker was in the room on the other side of the door and was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. It's like when you run up the stairs when you're a little kid and the thing's going to get you. I just can't. I have to run. I can't be in the hallway when it's dark. And he's like, oh, OK. You know what, though? I will say. We're we're getting started kind of weird here, but I will also say with the library location we've worked at for so long, we've experienced a lot of like kind of spooky stuff there. And then I told you my one friend uh, used to clean at that library after hours and she said, oh, yeah, it's haunted for sure. I've definitely gone to other locations that are like like she that's what she does for fun with her husband is she goes to like actual haunted places and stays the night and takes pictures and does you know ghost tours and stuff like that um and she's like i didn't like cleaning there by myself because spooky things would happen so i'm just like i feel justified in being spooked you know (laughs) yeah my place of work um because we definitely and we've had stuff happen to us when we were open during like business hours I, I'm sure you remember that one time where we, like, were standing there and talking about something and we heard, like, a door close and then, like, the bathroom start running and there was no, it was just, like, me, you, and, like, a library patron talking. And the library patron's like, uh, did you see that? Did you hear that? And we're like, yeah? And we all just kind of looked at each other like, uh, that's weird. I don't know what to do about that. So, yeah. I'm not even sure how we got on this topic. (laughs) I don't know. I just talked about, like, not getting killed by a demon at 3 a.m. and your ghoul door being open. And now, all of a sudden, we're talking about, like, the bathrooms. Yes. So, uh, (laughs) hi. (laughs) Hello. How are you? We're fine. Everything's great. We're we're fine here. We're fine here. Welcome to the Lake Erie Library. And, uh, yeah, today, apparently, we're starting on a spooky note. Which is fine. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Beth, and my ghoul door is... Um, <laughs> I'm Beth, and my ghoul door is open. <laughs> Ew. I, don't, I thought when you said ghoul door, you were going to say it like ick, because we were just talking about that the oh, other yeah. day. Like, my ghoul door is... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, my, my ghoul door is in the Airbnb I stayed in in New Orleans, because they had like this oh, weird yeah. closet that was like up above, it was like six feet above the ground, and it was directly. Oh my god, that probably sounded like shit. It was like directly across from my top bunk of a bunk bed that I was sleeping in. So all night long, I kept opening my eyes and expecting to see both doors like slowly swinging open. <laughs> and I was too scared to go out there. And like two of my guy friends, like one climbed on the other's back and like hoisted himself up there. He's like, eh, "It's just full of newspapers." And I was like, that's somehow worse. What were the newspapers for? Are they like, is it a collection of murders done by the owner of this house? Like, what the hell? And then we like left and we came back one night and somebody didn't lock the door. So like we went and we opened the door and it just like swung open and we're like, oh God, we're about to get murdered. Someone's been in the house. And they were like kids and they're like, hey, are you staying here? And we were like, yeah. And they're like, there was a guy standing at the gate just staring at the front of the house for like 20 minutes earlier. And I was like, oh, God, he's in the ghoul door. <laughs> and so the same guy friends, like, who are not big guys, like, go. And they, I remember the one, like, push kicked open the door. He, like, grabbed a knife from the kitchen and, like, kicked open the door. And it's a shotgun house. So you have to walk through yes, every room yes. to get to the back. So, like, they went and checked. And I literally stood at the front door ready to abandon them if I heard anything. And we had both sides of the shotgun house. And so I was like, I'm literally going to go fucking stay next door. I can't stand this. And then they came back. They're like, everybody's laptops are here. Like, nobody was in here. They would have taken those if, like, somebody had come in to rob us. Yikes. Whew. That's my ghoul door. <laughs> Uh, my ghoul door is in my basement, and the the door that Britta is referring to is it, it houses my water meter. When we bought our house, it everything was redone in the basement. That was part of the reason why we bought the house was because like the basement was remodeled, the kitchen was nice, like everything. We didn't have to do anything major to our house. 
so one of the remodel things they did was they um they put a little fancy a tiny door it's like i don't know maybe i'm thinking like one and a half feet by yeah maybe like two feet yeah it's it's tiny and it it literally houses the water meter <laughs> and like it has double doors and the left door was open and i Beth was peeing and i was by myself near a bunch of action figures that already scare me so <laughs> i just thought it was the end it's also right next to your fireplace down here, which I always assume is going to have like a raccoon. A in critter, it. yes. Uh, see, to me, that is the real fear. <laughs> if it was a raccoon, I would just befriend it and like slowly get it out of your house before your dog found it. <laughs> but like, if Slenderman's in there, I can't do anything. He's going to kill me. Yeah. So <laughs> I have like the five seconds it takes for him to unfold as he's climbing out, but first. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm just minding my own business in my bathroom. And that's like, wow, I should get a candle for in here. And I'm out here like, oh, God, the end is near. I got a busted leg and a busted arm. I can't run that fast. <laughs> oh, you know what, though? Uh, it's like good that we're talking about spooky stuff because that's what we're talking about today what this podcast episode. is not about anything related to anything we're talking about um this is about vinyl cutters and etsy vinyl cutters i don't know crickets crickets but don't every day is a nightmare here at the lake Erie library life is a series of meaningless disappointments and near misses well we're getting kind of nihilistic here beth is about to make out <laughs> with her pop filter it's i'm just i just want it to sound nice i that's can't all. wait till i go to edit this and it's like i just want to know like where everything is happening in here and like if you can understand what i'm saying at all and if this makes you sound like you're on a boat or something. Okay. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye. 2024 has already broken us. <laughs> so, hello. We are here. Uh, and today we are discussing winter horror uh, films. Horror. Horror. I have to really. It's like the rural juror. <laughs> I really have to watch how I say horror. We're talking about winter horrors. <laughs> Because, yes, I, I really think it might be because I talk out of the side of my mouth. I have a hard time pronouncing horror. Winter horror. It's, uh, I I watch Drew Barrymore speak, and then I see I speak, and I'm like, it's like, great. Like, that's, like, how she talks. Like, it's, like, great. <laughs> and I'm like, did I somehow get influenced by her as a small child i don't know i do talk a little bit out of the side of my mouth but you know it is what it is here we are i'm <laughs> in my mid-30s as this goes on you're just like fuck it whatever the first movie is <laughs> oh god oh, jesus christ <laughs> my laptop back fell over and i thought it was an animal I'm not even drinking anymore. I was going to say, dear listeners, we're not drinking. It's just herbal tea. It's, it's nothing. It's nothing. I didn't even put on aspirin cream. I'm pill free, baby. There's like nothing. I didn't put aspirin cream. <laughs> I got nothing but blood in these veins. Uh, I do have antibiotic ointment on my knees from my injury still because Sorry, dear listeners. I'm sure you remember that from a previous episode. Me, Beth and Britta are dealing with some falls of 2024 already. Speaking what of, was, like... What was your criteria for selecting these movies? Like, did you have things you were specifically, like, it's got to tick these boxes for me to count it? Or were you just um, like, mm, that was set in winter? Like, the middle of that. Like, I definitely had... I was like... Because there's a couple of them where I was like, well, that's mostly like indoors, but it feels like winter. 
And then I had to like double check. And I, I'll be honest with you, the one I don't know if it's actually, I don't know if it's actually predominantly set in winter or if it just snows in the movie. Because, you know, it, it can snow in spring, it can snow in fall. But predominantly it was is winter used in the plot somehow is kind of like, could this movie be set in summer? And for a couple of them, I'm like, no, definitely not. The other one I'm like, yeah, but like, it's still used in the plot. It's kind of like when people are like gremlins isn't truly a Christmas movie. I'm like, but it is. Cause if you took Christmas out of the plot, like it's not the same movie. Like, Billy is given, he's given Gizmo as a Christmas present. Uh, Phoebe Cates has a chip on her shoulder about Christmas. <laughs> um, the The Gremlins use Christmas. Uh, man, there's a whole scene dealing with gingerbread men and murder and Christmas uh, with the mom. So, like, it's all all intertwined. So that was kind of my biggest criteria is, like, is winter kind of used as a plot device? Mine was literally just, is there snow? <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't matter <laughs> anything else. I was like, yep, that's snow. All right, put it on the list. <laughs> I didn't realize, like, when I was putting them together, though, they all do kind of have, like, um, an unintentional overlap of, like, in regards to setting so i'm like oh okay well is that just all winter horror movies <laughs> or so well, you mean like in terms of because i was thinking about the movies i all, picked they all just are like it deals with like oh all this shit happens in like isolation like you yes. can't get help from anyone else because well, there's no one else around i i think that's just an aspect of winter horror movies though because yeah. you know i think primary like a very primal fear of humanity is being like we are made to survive the winter right like our baser instincts are like okay hunker down have food have shelter and winter if you're outside deprives you of like those two usually basic things although it's way easier to see if someone's following you at night in the winter because it's way lighter out yes yes um, but you know, in terms of like the nights are longer in winter, so the things that go bump in the night Dear are Lemuel, the nights are long, <laughs> the winters are cold. I've included this daguerreotype of my chest for you. Please come back from the war. If not, you can find my ghost at Punderson Manor. <laughs> so, you know, like I think people I think we I do think we think about that as like just the basics of like being a human and stuff like that like that's your primal instinct is winter is inherently even though a lot of movies take place in the summer and have summer horror themes like the winter movies are a different level of scary because on a baser instinct like if you grew up where there's snow you know that shit hits the fan when it snows like people don't know how to drive in the snow um, if it snows in places that doesn't normally get snow, like Texas or, you know, the South, they have crazy car pile ups and stuff like that. And like grocery stores are just like devastated because people have to stock up on everything. And, you know, I, I think that everyone can kind of resonate with that a little bit, um, I'm just now I'm thinking about working at a the retail grocery chain and uh one winter during Valentine's Day I worked and we had a terrible snowstorm and um all day I, it was a very very skeleton crew of people it was hard to get out of your driveway like it was a nasty snowstorm but we still had people coming in to this grocery store and as I said it was Valentine's Day they weren't getting bread they weren't getting butter no, or like milk booze booze and, and chocolate yeah it's and junk food alcohol and like maybe like a dvd of the godfather or something that's like super long but then i just laughed because like 10 months later the local newspaper read wrote an article and was like there has been a very big increase of births 
And we're like, what? What could be? What, what is? Why? Why is that happening? And I'm like, because Valentine's Day was on a snowstorm, you dum dums. And I mean, every- there's always a higher number of babies born because of New Year's and Valentine's Day. It's true. It's true. So I just laughed because I went. Lemuel, it's the one day of the year that you may see my ankles. <laughs> I just laughed because I was like, <laughs> I was there. I, I was sold there the that alcohol day. that created you, little Jimmy. <laughs> no condoms were sold that day. <laughs> Shelves were fully stocked. But yeah, I think that yeah, I I think that is like a. I would say that's probably used a lot as a trope in kind of winter horror movies, which it's fair. And I, I don't tire of it because I, I feel like there's enough variation in the winter horror movies that it's like used well. Yeah, I feel like I my dream is to just like um live away from other humans. Like I want to live on the side of a mountain in the woods where you it's going to take you forever to get to me so no one can drop by unannounced and i just want to in that same location have like a great internet access signal and like for my cell phone to work so i guess i got to get one of those like satellite phones yeah but other than that i'm like no just leave me up there alone with my like horde of like foxes and raccoons and possums that i've befriended I'll have a million pets and nobody come by. And that is like not horrific to me. That is a dream. But then when you're like, oh, no, it's a whole town is stranded in the same grocery store. I'm like, Jesus Christ, just kill me now. I hate all these people and I'm stuck with them. Get out of here. That's fair. That's fair. So, yeah, I I think that's that's a good launching off point to start with. And I think. I'll start with kind of one of the bigger ones when you said when we were talking about themes of movies and stuff to watch and we're like winter horror. The One of the first ones that came to mind was The Thing and that's from John Carpenter. That one, I had to double check because I was like, wait a minute, is it actually me? set in the it is set in the winter time. It's set in the early winter, but it, the reason I questioned it is because it's set in antarctica see but i think it counts anyway because there's just always it's always snow, snow. it's always winter in antarctica and we're gonna get science we're gonna get science people on here who actually they have seasons in antarctica they do but it's not like it's like seasons of light and darkness it's not like there's always snow there. always cold um it is different levels of cold i follow a guy i think i've showed you his stuff before yeah. he's um Oh no! And now I'm gonna like embarrass myself. He uh, maybe he's from New Zealand or maybe he's Australian, and I'm so sorry if anybody knows exactly who I'm talking about. I just want to be his friend, so now I feel bad. But he was in Antarctica for like six months, and he made a ton of content about what daily life is like there. And then like the one day he like drove over to like the U.S. base, and it was like there's a movie theater, and, like <laughs> there's all this shit there. And he's like, "Wow, this is really nice. I guess I'll just go back home now." <laughs> Oh, so yeah, this movie was made in 1982 um, by John, directed by John Carpenter, uh, stars Kurt Russell in it. Uh, love him in this movie. It also stars uh, Keith David. It has a really good cast in it. Um, Wilford Brimley, Richard Mazur, T.K. Carter, David Clennon, Richard Dreisart. So it has it has a nice, really nice cast. Um, when this movie was first made, it did not do well because it came out the same time that E.T. had come out. And people didn't want to watch this very depressing horror movie about um, men trapped in two an Antarctic base. Two opposite sides of like, alien life. Yes, two <laughs> opposite sides of alien life. Um, but this movie is a, technically it's a remake um, from the 50s movie, The Thing from Another World. Um, John Carpenter actually con- considers that the superior film <laughs> in many interviews he's talked about that i i've seen this thing several times like if it's on tv or something we'll sit and watch it this movie did not do well but it has gained a cult following and it has since been reassessed and it is now like 
critically acclaimed. It is considered like one of the best horror movies. And it, in terms of, it's one of those movies to me that like you take everything that's great about the thing from another world, but to update it and modernize it, they did resort to like gore and special effects and things, but I think it makes it that much better because it's so visually interesting and exciting compared to like the original that you not only have the tension and the terror of the plot that's happening but you also are like your eyeballs are seeing some wildly grotesque things that you're just like oh my god so for those of you who have never seen this movie uh the basic premise of it is you have a research team at an antarctica uh, base who tensions are not super high but like it's it's not a easy life. It's kind of grueling. You are surrounded by cold and darkness all the time. Um, there's very little daylight, like, kind of thing. And they see, they see this guy outside, and they investigate it, and they realize upon he dies, and they realize upon doing his autopsy that he is not human. And so they have this alien essentially infect their research team base and the reason it's called the thing is because the thing is able to um mimic and like replicate itself to look like other team members so you don't know who's infected with the thing until it's far too late and so tensions mount as kind of these research team members are picked off one by one and it it's really really good it is a it is a classic movie in like storytelling tension because you don't know who is who and then it is expounded on very um graphic practical special effects like these were groundbreaking at the time that they they created them there's there is as a trigger warning does the dog die? Oh yes. My God, yes. Yes. The, there's a team of dogs. They do not live. So if that is something that is upsetting to you, um, I didn't know the first person I watched this with was uh, prior to my husband. It was my ex boyfriend. Uh, and I sat and watched it. I was not given a trigger warning for that. And so I sat there with my 16 year old like mind going, oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like um, the majority of the bad things that happen to the dogs are, like, so ridiculous that it's, like, I mean, it, like, is awful, but you can kind of stomach it. But then, like, the one that he just, like, looks outside and it's got, like, an axe in its neck and I'm just like, oh, look at the doggy. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's it's such a well-done scene. There is one scene in particular I will talk about where they figure out that they can do like a test and they put they figure out heat is something that this alien life form does not like so they all draw blood and they put it in these little like petri dishes and they have like this wire that's been like he keeps heating it, it with like a flame it, yes <laughs> uh, so you have kurt russell who has this beautiful long lux- luxurious hair and this like leather bomber jacket he is absolutely like crazy one of my movie crushes is like Kurt Russell in the thing um, as McCready and he is the helicopter pilot. And so part of the reason that, you know, this movie works as a winter horror movie is it's, it's set in Antarctica. They, they can't get a hold of anybody. There's also, there is a Norwegian research base that they try to contact, which is where the guy came from at the beginning. Yes. And they can't get a hold of that research team. So they are isolated And they can't leave because there's a winter storm coming in. So it's supposed to get to like, you know, sub freezing temperatures and stuff like that. So they're really supposed to just hunker down and stay inside. But they have this horrible thing happening. And they have this this scene, which is so well done in tension, where they all draw blood. It's in Petri dishes. Kurt Russell is taking this like wire that's been heated by a flamethrower and he has the flamethrower on him and he has the wire and he's just going down the line and all of them are labeled so you know whose is whose and you have all of these other guys sitting tied in chairs but they're all sitting right next to they're each all other like tied to like a 
a bench of seats. Yes. So, like they're all tied together essentially. Yes. And neither none of them know who is like who is infected with this alien life form, who is not. And so he's just going down the line and the person that you think is going to be it is not the person. And then when they finally do it, some crazy special effects happen and the poor guy that's sitting next to the guy that's infected is like, ah! and it's. I love the end when he's like, mm, I know you guys have been going through a lot, but when you get the chance, could you untie me? Because I don't want to spend the rest of the fucking winter tied to this chair. <laughs> and it's it's just so well done. And I would say the ending, the ending of this movie without I won't tell you how it ends, but. It ends in a way that you might have to watch this multiple times to kind of figure out who, if the thing lives, if the thing dies, who is left. And it ends in a way that's very open to interpretation. Uh, John Carpenter has come on record and said that it is, he says, it is very clear and distinctive as to who is obviously an alien and who is not. And that the ending is not that uh, discreet, but I would say for the casual moviegoer, put your phone away and really pay attention. And it's, it's a very bleak ending. So when you contrast that to, I don't know, say E.T., uh, <laughs> you can see why it didn't do well at the box office. It's cold. It's dark. It's grim. It's all the psychological tension that you can imagine amped up tenfold uh just bounded by like this very fleshy grotesque horror um because you do get to watch the thing kind of change shape and form and it is it is horrifying but also you are fixated on it because it's you, you I have not seen any special effects replicated in modern horror the way these were done in this movie so yeah, that's what I feel like we should kick off with. It's it's worth a watch. I would highly recommend it. Um, not for the faint of heart for gore though. Before we move on to the next one, I will mention that there is a newer, yes, version of this from 2011 that also did not do well in theaters. It and I, it's because they redid the CGI or they redid the effects. They had them all practical and then they redid them to CGI. And so a lot of like horror fans got poo poo. They did not Are like it. You're talking that. about the one with Mary Elizabeth Winstead? I am. Oh, I thought the overwhelming reason that they were pissed about it was because it was marketed as a reboot and it's not a reboot. It's actually a prequel. <laughs> no, that's, I, I read it was because people went to see it and they were expecting like practical effects see, and stuff like that. And then that was why I was mad when I saw it. Cause I was, we don't need a reboot of it. The first one's good. Like, why are you rebooting everything? And that was like the general consensus amongst people I knew who were like, no, fuck that movie. Nobody needs to see that. Nobody wants that. And then I saw it and I was like, Oh wait, this is actually pretty good. Yeah. And yeah, like at the time, like they did not market it as a prequel. So when they, you get they to the reboot, they marketed market it, it as, as a reboot. reboot. Yeah. And, and when you get to the end, like you realize like it ends with a dog running from the Norwegian base that is infected with the thing. And one of the surviving people jumping in a helicopter to chase after the dog before it can infect anyone else. And that is directly into the beginning of the right. thing. Right. That is so, how the beginning of the yeah. John Carpenter movie. So, I mean, I don't hate it. I think it's like, a decent movie especially if you're like i want to just like watch a whole lot of the thing like do it watch them who cares do, uh, do it, your own thing it's got mary elizabeth winstead in it i will say yeah you it's if got you've Joel see, edgerton in it if it's you've got seen the thing tormund from you, game of thrones in it you will know that how this 2011 movie is going to end but that's one small part of yes. the ending like you don't know who else is gonna like make it or not make it from right the people who are in it and like it's got this stellar cast like i also love Adewale Akinoye, who's from um lost and he was in the second mummy movie oh okay he's mr echo yeah on lost and then he's um like the the bad guy's hunchman in the okay. in the second <laughs> mummy who's like doing the knife thing with, yeah 
um, with the kid on the train. And he's like, you missed. <laughs> he's like, oh, wow, that was great. I missed that, like, that guy. <laughs> um, yeah, they're all in it. And I like Eric Christian Olsen's in it, who I had like a huge crush oh, on. And yeah. I think that's probably why I initially did like watch it. And then I was like, wait, this isn't bad. So, yeah, I mean, two for one, if you want to do a double feature, um, I, yeah, I can't recommend the John Carpenter movie enough. Also, can't recommend it enough because, as I said, we're birthday twins, so, like, I always got to praise my boy. I love that I say my boy like I'm older than him. You're my like, boy, Blue. <laughs> You're my boy. I mean, that's, yeah, that's about the, the what you would call it, the relationship we have. So I guess um, I'm just going to go to the top of my list and start with 30 Days of Night, which is, let's see, let me go back to the other part of my notes now and find it in my million tabs that are open. I will tell you, as a small aside, I saw this in theaters with uh, my husband and I went in not knowing anything about like the comic or anything like that. Went in blind and I was horrified. Yeah, it's uh an IDW comic franchise, but it's from 2007 and I think I also saw this in theaters. I would have been in like Philly at that point. Cuz it came out in October. So it is set in the town of Barrow, Alaska. Which I think maybe is not called Barrow, Alaska anymore, if I'm remembering correctly. I think it has like an indigenous name now. Oh, okay. But essentially it opens with the town getting ready to enter into like the month long period when because they're so far north, like they do not have a sunrise. So this is they do this every year. Like you see families, like some of them are like literally leaving on like the last plane out to get to like, you know, like the lower 48 states or whatever, or like they're going to visit family in other places where it is not quite so dark and dim for the month. Like you see like one family's like, yeah, yeah, I know. I know you can't do 30 days without sunshine. I get it. Like, you know, I'll see you and the girls when you come back. Like, We'll be fine. Oh, boy. And so um, <laughs> it stars Josh Hartnett, uh, another early 2000s crush. Uh, yes. I don't think I ever had a crush on him, but he was in like a lot of horror movies. Oh, and, like, I teen had a movies around that time. big crush on him with the faculty. And yeah. yeah. And uh, Melissa George is also in it. And so is uh, Ben Foster who he he is like at this point in his career i think he is just like exclusively playing like disgusting human beings both in oh, looks yes. and in like character but yeah essentially this this town is getting ready for 30 days of night when they are uh, attacked by vampires who are taking advantage of essentially 30 days of free hunting without having to worry about getting cooked by the sun. Wild thing I just thought about. So one, how would you feel you came back, like you were one of the people that went to the lower 48 and then you came back to your town and went, oh God, what happened? Yeah. Um, but also, I guess this is just a phys physiological question. Do vampires actually need to sleep? Because like that, I I always thought like I don't think like, so. But they don't need like they don't need to be in the sun because they get like whoosh, vamoosed. Yeah, um, this is not like a Twilight. I'm just sparkly and don't want people to know I'm a vampire. It, like they turn to ash and right. they die. But I'm just like I a lot of vampire lore is like oh yeah I go to sleep during the day and then I awaken refreshed in the evening. <laughs> so I'm like, do they actually need to sleep because? Also in Twilight lore, like, Edward says he doesn't need to sleep. That's why he watches Bella sleep. Yeah, I mean, these ones don't seem like they need to sleep. Like, it's pretty continuous from, like, the second that they start attacking. And right. And got Ben Foster is sort of their little, like, Renfield. Like, he goes in and he, like, you know, sabotages ways out and cuts communications and does all the things that they can't quite do before everyone is trapped. And he does this under the assumption that they are going to 
take, oh, yeah. <laughs> take care of him and take him with them. So it is essentially the whole movie takes place over one month, over 30 days. It, Regardless of time of day, it looks like it's nighttime. It is very snowy. Um, so it is very gory and bloody, which means there's lots of red blood spatter on the snow. Mm-hmm. Again, there is animal death in this. Um, These vampires aren't nice. They are terrifying too. yeah like i was so scared of danny houston for so long after this he's yeah. kind of like the main vampire my one question is i would i wish i would have looked into it too to like see what people like what first nation and indigenous people think of it because the vampires all speak in this other language because it is like you know they're old they've been here forever so they don't speak english and I don't know if it is, like, an actual language. I did not research that. Or if this is, like, a made-up language that is just imitating. Which, could, that's kind of ick. So, like, I don't know. I wonder what their take on it would be. I mean, there is a character that is, like, an indigenous Alaskan who, like, he talks about, like, how his family is, like, you know, like, they're a tribe. They're out on, like, their own. They don't live in town. So, like, he references that, and he kind of gives a tiny bit of perspective character-wise in this, but that's that's my only question of it. Other than that, it is, like, super gory. It is super isolated. It is very, like, oh, my God, we are trapped in, like, the enemy is outside vibes, so. Uh, Josh Hartnett plays the he's, sheriff, He's, right? like, the sheriff. His name is Eben. E B E N, which makes me nuts because it just sounds like everybody has like a speech impediment because it's not a super common name anymore. Um, and then Melissa George is his wife, and they're like separated, and she does not intend to get stuck there for the thirty days, but they're sort of like thrown back together. I remember I was so sad at the end of this movie, though. <laughs> like the yeah. ending's pretty upsetting. Yeah, yeah, but... it's not a happy ending, which is also why I was horrified because most. Most horror movies, especially vampire horror movies, are usually like vampire comes in, causes some issues, but the good guys prevail. Yeah. You don't see horror movies where like the ending is like, oh, oh shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is not a happy ending. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, it is like a happy ending, but it's not a happy ending. Mm hmm. I don't know how else to explain it without spoiling it, so I won't. I, there I, is there is like a sequel to this too. I I refuse to watch it. Um, well, yeah, I, I I have not seen that one. Yeah, either. and I'm, then I read m- most of the comics, so also worth a visit. Yeah, if you are looking for vampire horror, that is holy cow! This is terrifying. That would be I'd be like yes. Put down the hammer horror. Put down uh, Gary Oldman as Dracula. Please pick this up and watch it because you will. Yeah, these these vampires compared to those vampires are like the Holland ass twenty eight days later zombies compared to like Night of, Night the, of the Living, Living Dead yeah. zombies. Yeah, very much so. Good movie though, like good horror movie for winter. And then go brush your teeth, because looking at Ben Foster's mm-hmm, nasty mm-hmm, teeth mm-hmm, in this, they're going to make you feel like your mouth is dirty. I will piggyback on some vampire horror, and I'm going to talk about Let the Right One In. Also a vampire movie, also a horror movie. Not as spooky, but not as spooky. Based off of a book called Let the Right One In, and I believe... Is this Norwegian? I believe it's Norwegian. Um, Let me check. It's by Lindqvist. Is that Swedish? Swedish. And so there is a there is a uh, an American remake of that movie. I remember this and the Stieg Larsson girl with the dragon tattoo. They like made the movies, and then they're like, "We're gonna make an American version." And I was like, "Are we just piggybacking, or are we just we can't?" do subtitles or anything i don't what is happening why is this happening but anyways uh the premise of this movie is it is about so it is swedish because it's set in stockholm the premise of this is there's a little boy who is kind of living a rough life like he's bullied often he lives with his mom but he's 
you know, very kind of single parent household. And he develops this friendship with this girl, what looks to be a girl with like dark hair. And it's set in the early 1980s. Yeah, it is based off of a book by John uh, Lindquist. Lindquist, who wrote the screenplay. So if you read the book, it's pretty close to it. The American version, which is, I think, just uh, Let Me In. I think so. Yeah. Um, that one is, it's fine. Like, I watched that one. It's, you know, it it's an okay adaptation of Isn't it. Isn't Chloe Grace Moritz? Yes. Uh, she plays the she plays in that one as the the girl, so yeah, it's it is about this boy who essentially he is telling this story as like a flashback, but he befriends this vampire girl and she kind of takes care of these bullies and stuff and befriends him, but he's also like her daylight companion because she can't go out at night and stuff like that. So the horror is that he's friends with her and like he's dealing with a lot of stuff at home and she takes care of him but she takes care of him in a very violent and dramatic way there is one particular scene where you aren't really seeing all of the carnage that is happening he is being uh, the boy is being bullied like mercilessly at this swimming pool and he's going swimming and they are trying to drown him. Essentially, his bullies are trying to drown him. So it's not like they're being nice since it's in Sweden and they, too, have very long, like, nights. Um, his vampire friend comes to rescue him and she slaughters all of these bullies who are trying to drown him, which is, like, nice that, you know, he's not dead. And he, like, pops up from the water after, like, almost drowning and he, like, sees her and he's like, Oh, hi. I missed like all the like blood against like the very green, like that light green you see at like pools and stuff like that. It's visually a very interesting movie. Again, snow with like blood on the ground, very dark, but like with fluorescent like lit, it's supposed to be set in the 80s. So you have that aesthetic as well. But it's like worth the watch if you're interested in kind of this, like he has like this kind of almost romantic relationship with her as well like he loves her he for sure has like a little crush yeah on her. yeah um which you know if you had like a girl that was essentially a superhero like doing I mean, it doesn't matter at that age like if a girl is your friend like you probably have a crush yeah. on her <laughs> yeah it's like worth a watch if you are looking for a different type of horror the horror is like i'm befriending a monster at what point do I, am I done with, like, the horror aspect of being her friend? Like, what happened to her other friends? How old is she? Type of thing. Like, and just kind of the schematics of, like, what does it mean to be friends with, like, a vampire? And what does it mean to be with somebody who's perpetually, like, looks like she's 12, but I'm getting older? Type of thing. So, yeah, if you want to watch something, this is definitely set in the winter. It's definitely set, um at nighttime and it has doesn't have as much of the isolation aspects of it as it does have like the other winter aspects of it but it it's worth a watch and i think it ends better than <laughs> 30 days of night <laughs> so the next one i want to talk about is werewolves within which is a it's from 2021 it's a mystery comedy horror <laughs> amazing um, it is based on the video game of the same name. Oh, okay. So, I don't know this one. So yeah, I'm... so it is um, it is available to stream right now on Hulu if you have that. Okay. But it stars Sam Richardson, Melania Vantrub, who is, I just call her cute AT&T girl. She's like the cute girl from the phone commercials. Oh, okay. Um, George Basil, Sarah Burns, Michael Chernis, Catherine Curtin, Wayne Duvall, Harvey Guillen, who is Guillermo on What We Do in the Shadows, okay. uh, Rebecca Henderson, Cheyenne Jackson from Broadway, and Michaela Watkins from okay. Saturday Night Live, and Glenn Fleshler. And it follows a group of people in a small Vermont town who get trapped in a snowstorm only to suspect one of them is a werewolf. This so, is essentially like the game of Mafia. Yeah, it's, and so it's um like it's the small town dynamic. Everybody knows each other's shit. Everybody kind of like hates each other a little bit. Um, 
the sheriff is like a new guy that's Finn Wheeler is their like forest ranger sheriffy type authority um and he comes in to this already like tense situation because the town is divided over a pipeline that's been proposed to come through so like the town like uppity up businessman Sam Parker is like I want to put a pipeline in like we'll get money and like half of them are like no it's gonna like wreck what's great about our city and the other half are like we want money Hmm. Finn like befriends the uh like mail carrier cecily who's cute at&t girl she it's obvious that they like are kind of into each other and there's this great scene in a bar where they're playing the jukebox and it's all like 90s music and so they put on ace of bass and she's like dancing around (laughs) to like i saw the sign and like trying to flirt with them and they like have to like the first thing that happens is they find that somebody kills someone's like dog so you don't see it happen it's a lot of like the camera is in the perspective of the thing that they're looking at and then they're all looking down at the camera every time like somebody is like murdered or the dog is killed or anything like that and then like Michaela Watkins is like super campy and she's like who killed my chachi (laughs) and like loses her mind over it and so and her husband is like a scumbag and flirts with like every woman and so they all like realize as these things are happening and like you know like their generators get cut and they're like losing power and they're all like kind of like hunkering down in the same spot but then they're all just like no you're a werewolf i'm leaving and then they're all separated and so it's so funny they like suspect this like sort of like the town outcast and everybody like turns against him at one point and uh he's like a very like grizzly adams type character <laughs> uh and like Everyone does. There's so many like dumb good one-liners. There's like, it's it's everything you want, and it's in the middle of a snowstorm, <laughs> and there's werewolves. So and yeah, that's that's all I can say without like spoiling anything. But if you, I mean, I don't know if you, anybody has played the game, and you loved it or you hated it. Or you didn't even know they made a movie out of it. I don't know, but there is a movie out of it. And I had a really fun time watching it. So yeah. Werewolves within. Uh so I guess I'll I'll take a cue from you and I will also talk about one that is uh campy horror silliness. And <laughs> we're gonna do it's a Norwegian film from two thousand nine. That is a comedy horror, and it is called Dead Snow. And the basic premise of this, so I haven't seen it, but it's on my to-watch list because I've heard good... Th- I love zombie movies. Like, zombie movies are... If you had to explain things that make Beth, Beth, like, brain... Like, if they had the brain of Beth and parts that are labeled, like, zombies would be a nice chunk of my brain. Which is ironic, because they want to eat brains. Um... <laughs> But it's essentially, it is a zombie horror film, and it's about a group of students uh, surviving a zombie Nazi attack. So the zombies are Nazis. They're dressed up as Nazis. If you ever look at the cover, I remember seeing this cover. Uh, It's a guy, his head is like half like sticking out of the snow, and he's got like the SS hat on. There is a Scandinavian type of zombie or folkloric uh thing similar to zombies called the dragger who they are undead greedily protecting their stolen treasures this is an Norwegian film it is dubbed um it was made in 2009 but the basic plot of it is that she's you know a, it opens with a girl getting eaten as she's being chased across the snow snows of norway and she gets eaten by zombies wearing world war ii nazi ss uniforms but the basic premise of it is you have these group of students who are at on easter vacation but it's so cold and snowy up there that it's technically like winter they are essentially attacked by these nazi zombies and they have to survive the night That's as much as I'll tell you without spoiling too much more of the plot. Again, I haven't watched it. It's on my to-watch list, but I feel like it's 
worthwhile if you're looking for a campy zombie movie. There's also a sequel. There's also a sequel. Dodd Snow 2. Yes. Red versus Dead. Yes. That one's not as wintry, though. <laughs> so you've seen both of these. <laughs> I just like that there's a, the, like, the, I, it's not an umlau, but it's the, like, O with the strike through it mm-hmm. in the original title. Dodd Snow. Dodd Snow. So yeah, I just feel like if you're going for campy horror, these the two titles we just said would fit fit the bill for that, which there should be campy winter horror movies, right? Like all these other ones are pretty serious business. Yeah. <laughs> the closest to camp that I have to move into is Curtains from 1983. Yeah. It's not quite camp. It is uh it's, it's real wild. obvious that it like doesn't really know what it wants to be and that it started out as two very different things Mm -hmm. like one of them was like no it's an art house film and the other was like no it's a really campy 80s slasher and then like they got in a fight and then like somebody left and then the other one was like i'm gonna do what i want do you Um, think is it the type of movie as me and my husband always discuss is it the type of movie that was trying to take it so seriously and then like 100 percent, and then like it, it unintentionally is funny yep Okay, because yeah. to me that's ninety percent of eighties unintentional yeah, slasher usually, films. Usually, I usually don't like that, um, but I think the like it's not that niche because there's a million movies and stories that have this like exact same plot. But I think the fact that like the whole uh, idea of it is that it is six actresses who go to this remote like mansion to audition for a film. And then are slowly one by one murdered, uh, is like what got me. So it's without like spoiling anything. Essentially, it starts off with you see this actress Samantha and the director of like a film that she's working on, whose name is Stryker, Jonathan Stryker, and she is like a very method actress. So she feigns mental illness so that she can be committed to a, a mental hospital so that she can do research and the director like helps her like he is the one who is like there like helping like commit her Mm. but once she is like finished with intake and is left there she finds out that he has actually done this on purpose to get her out of the way so he can cast a younger woman in her role and that's when he has, like, these six young actresses come up to his, like, remote mansion to audition for him. You ever auditioned at, like, a remote place? Uh, yeah, but not like that. <laughs> like, and I didn't go by myself. I went with, like, my boyfriend at the time who also went and auditioned for the same thing. I do remember in, like, college, though, like, looking at, like, um, like casting websites, and there was, like, one, like, I was in school in Michigan my freshman year, and, like, uh, they asked me to send, like, a headshot and a resume, and then they were like, are you okay with full frontal? And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck kind of movie is this? <laughs> I was like, no, I'm good, thanks. Lose my information. So I think it was just, like, a really shitty horror movie that, like... Yeah. Yeah. These girls, like one of them is like a stand up comedian. So you have to sit through like part of her stand up act as part of it. And it's like very 80s female comedian comedy. There's another like pretty well known actress, Brooke, a ballet dancer named Lorian, a musician named Tara, and a professional ice skater named Christy. And so. Like, one of the best scenes in this movie happens while Christy is ice skating. And this is not spoiling anything. I'm just setting the mood for you. Like, imagine (laughs) you are out minding your own business, ice skating on this beautiful pond. Okay. And then you turn around and you see someone in a terrifying fucking mask slowly ice skating towards (laughs) you. And you have nowhere to go except into the woods. Like, you just have to run. So, like... In ice skates. In ice skates. In the winter. So, like, there's that. There is this... There's this reoccurring doll. Like, one of the girls brings this doll with her. Mm -hmm. It is, like, a creepy-ass freaking, like, American girl Samantha-looking doll. Like, this is from the 80s, so it's not an American girl doll. But that's what it looks like. And I was like, get that shit 
out of here. Like, don't nobody want that. <laughs> this like middle of nowhere mansion. I don't care if it's your toy. Get out. There's like one scene with titties, which felt like not a lot for an 80s slasher. No, and it's that's like light not, for. It's like not gratuitous, but it is like one girl looking at the other girl's titties. So like, <laughs> I don't know. I was like, okay, go ahead, do your thing. There's like a. The director is, like, such a shithead, and he reminds me of so many, like, why are men (laughs) men that I know in, like, the theater community, and just, like, how they, like, treat women like shit, and it's, like, he's intentionally, like, humiliating people in front of the other girls just to, like, fuck with them, but he does it, like, quote-unquote, in the name of art, and I'm, like, oh, get out of here, go kick rocks, so... That's that's primarily where the like overacting, over dramatics come from. Um, the kills are ridiculous. Well, so yeah, they it's, gotta it's they gotta like, set it up different. Yeah, it's they're they're pretty out there. Um, the mask is like a disgusting like old crone mask yeah. with flowy blonde hair. Yeah, that's that's curtains. all I got to say about that. Yeah, curtains. <laughs> You'll never work in this town again. Um, you know, I don't have anything. Woo! (laughs) (laughs) Uh, My microphone fell. That was scary. Your microphone was just like, I'm fucking done with this shit. (laughs) Curtains. I'm curtains. They're on me. I guess you know what I'll I'll start with my it's not campy but it's it is a movie that was made for a love of uh, gothic romance and um it is directed by Guillermo del Toro and the movie I am referencing is Crimson Peak. God, it's so good. It's I love this movie. I want to make out with everyone in this movie. There's a lot of attractive people in oh this movie. Oh my god. Even um, her dad. Everyone is so hot. <laughs> <laughs> um so this was made in 2015 and um it has a really good casket cast in it. <laughs> it has a good casket. It has uh, Mia Was- Was- Wasikowski. Wasikowski. Um, you would know her from Alice in Wonderland, the Tim Burton movies. She's in a couple other horror movies, and she's in she, Jane Eyre. She played Jane Eyre yeah, with Michael so Fassbender. Yes, yeah, so she's very... She has one of those faces that you're like, uh, yes, you look like you lived a gothic like romance life at one point you belong in the 1800s um tom hiddleston's in it jessica shastain is in it charlie hunnam's in it uh and jim beaver jim beaver you would know from uh supernatural supernatural bobby Bobby. that's her dad (laughs) yeah so it's set in edwardian era england and it follows uh mia who plays i'm trying to remember her name it follows her. Her name is uh, Edith, and it starts in Buffalo, New York, and she's an heiress of wealthy businessman Carter Cushing. And immediately, like sh- the beginning of the film, is she is visited by her mom's ghost, who says, "Beware of Crimson Peak." A few years later, rolls by, and she's a budding author. She's just kind of living a life of what I would consider luxury, and she runs into. English uh, baronet uh, Sir Thomas Sharp and his sister Lucille. Thomas is seeking investors for in- his inventions, uh, a digging machine to revive his family's clay mines. But her dad, who is like wealthy and an investor, is like, no, nah, I'm not interested. However, Thomas has a plan B and he starts romancing Edith to the point where he. Um, he they become romantically attached and her her dad gets suspicious that that party scene there's like a dance scene and she's Mm -hmm. like the weird girl and like the popular beautiful girl is so sure that like hiddles is gonna like fall madly in love with her and she's gonna be swept away to this life of luxury and he comes up and he like 
asks her to dance with him instead and everyone is like what the fuck and she's like <laughs> uh i think you're mistaken she probably wants to dance and he's like i don't want to dance with her i want to dance with you yes and they're holding candles yes oh my god it's yes inject it's, it directly into my vein it's this movie is very aesthetically pleasing um it, when i say aesthetically pleasing like it it is and it isn't the ghosts in it are scary they're, terrifying. they're very scary but it is it is very when you think peak gothic like romance of like this dark decaying manners and stuff like that and beautiful long flowing dresses this movie is it this movie there is, is like, like a weird scene with dead butterflies though where jessica chastain is like rubbing them on her face that like <laughs> i could have done without that one um well she's kind of an odd it's, character it's also a vibe though he becomes romantically he tries to get romantically involved with her and then the the, the dad is like investing and is like this is not good and he tries to bribe the sharp siblings to leave america and thomas has to break edith's heart so he's under the pretense like the dad is essentially like you stay away from my daughter and so thomas is like all right so he like disparages edith and like talks about how crappy her novel is even though he's been like no you're a really good writer you should keep doing this he ends up reconciling with her shortly after that and then her dad is brutally murdered so all this happens very quickly in the beginning if you're like beth why are you telling me a plot by plot thing because i have to set you up for it her dad is dead and then thomas proposes marriage to her and then she ends up going to this dilapidated house which she finds out when she's there in england that it's called crimson peak because it's on top of a clay mine and the it's clay is the red clay that comes up from the soil so yes it's like red it's crimson it's crimson and it's on top of this like english moor hill and it's snowing and it's very wintry and she gets to this house and there's literally a hole in the ceiling <laughs> leaning down and you're just like and she's just like uh what did i get myself into so immediately upon getting there she's like there's some weird stuff going on and she has ghosts kind of like trying to warn her of things that are happening and you might be like beth but where is charlie hunnam in all of this well let me tell you he plays a doctor and he's very good friends with Edith. So Edith not only has Tom Hiddleston like lusting after her, but she also has Charlie Hunnam. And I'm like, ma'am, this is too much. So Charlie Hunnam's doctor character does not trust uh, Tom Hiddleston. So he actually goes after her and tries to journey towards her. And there's one point where like toxic masculinity and like she was mine first yes. pays off, but. So yes, I, I won't spoil the ending. There is a twist in the where you are not expecting it, and it does. Oh God! It <laughs> it hits all the. I would say it hits a lot of the gothic romance tropes that you're expecting, but it is pretty horrifying. Like the twist is pretty where you don't. Were you expecting the twist in this movie? Um. Yes, but don't let that be like an indication of how other people do it. I just. There are certain genres that I, like, consume too much of them, so I just am like, whoop, well, this didn't happen, so I think it's going to be that. Oh, look, I figured it out. <laughs> but, yeah, it is it is worth a watch. I I think this was panned when it first came out. Like, people were oh, like... Oh, people hated it. I, but I'm like, I don't know why. I, I think they just didn't get it. I was like, it... I... the So weirdly enough the trailers for it were actually pretty accurate it showed ghosts it showed mm -hmm. her at a decaying mansion the movie doesn't have a ton of ghosts in it it has enough that you're like okay this is spooky this hits the but it is horrifying for the real life things happening not just for the supernatural aspects of it so if you are looking for a very aesthetically and visually stunning movie um, that is set at winter and that is a horror story this is this is the movie i would recommend to you mm. Mm. so uh that was like 2015 we're gonna go backwards a few years to 2010 to frozen 
And I'm not talking about Anna and Elsa, which is like my favorite thing that happens. Uh, I do at the remember library, that. Is that like everybody wanted the Disney cartoon and they kept accidentally ordering this. And I was like, you do not want to show your children this movie. Please <laughs> no. let me order you the right thing. This is not what you want. Don't don't just go by the title when you're ordering things. The cold never bothered us anyway. <laughs> the cold made me peel all my skin off my hands. <laughs> So uh, this Frozen is a psychological survival horror film, and it stars Sean Ashmore, who you would know he was both of these guys were in a lot of things in like the 2000s. Um, Sean was Bobby slash Iceman in the X-Men movies, and he was Jake on Animorphs. Okay. He was also in The Ruins, which is also an excellent horror movie that maybe we can talk about like in summertime or something like that. And he is also on The Boys, I think. He's Lamplighter. He's also a twin. So sometimes I get confused by his... He has a brother, Aaron. I did not know this. Yeah, what? they are like identical twins. So there's Aaron and there's Sean. They, you said they are identical? Yeah. Yes, I can tell. Um, I, you... Aaron was Jimmy Olsen on Smallville. <laughs> Sean is an X-Men. They're identical twins. That... Those poor man. Why would you both get into like superhero movies? Well, there was that other. Do you remember there were other twins from the nineties who were identical twin brothers, and they were in like everything. And then they always joked because one of them worked construction outside of like movie Ugh. stuff, and he he accidentally cut off some of his toes. And he's like, "That's the only way you can tell us apart is like you got to count the toes." Oh. So this was, like, the era. Like, the 90s and 2000s were, like, twins, hot commodity. Let's do it. Mary-Kate and Ashley, the guys with no toes, the Ashmore (laughs) twins. Knock knock it out of the park. So you got Sean Ashmore in this one. You got Kevin Zegers, who was also, um, like, a teen heartthrob. Do you remember him? Uh, maybe. He was in Air Bud. Oh, you know what? And I Gossip watch, Girl. I didn't watch either of uh, those. He was in the new, the 2004 Dawn of the Dead. Oh, wait, 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 wait. He's in Mortal Instruments. Oh, yes, I do. I had a crush on him in Dawn Everybody. of the Dead. Everybody. He was so cute mm-hmm. in the 2000s. I mean, he's still cute, but this was like the heyday of his acting career when I when this came out. And Emma Bell is also in it. And it's the story of these three friends who Sean Ashmore's character and Kevin's character, that's Dan and Joe, have been friends for a long time. And, like, Dan has been away at, like, school and, like, he has this girlfriend, Parker, and he brings Parker home. And there's, like, a little bit of tension because, like, you know, Dan and Joe have been literally best friends since elementary school and they're kind of growing apart. And they're kind of like going in different directions in their lives. And so they have this ski trip, essentially. And there's some tension between the girlfriend and the friend, like Sean Ashmore's character, where he's just like, she sucks. Like, she's snowboarding. We came out here to ski. Like, snowboarding is dumb. <laughs> and like, I wish that wasn't like a real thing yeah. but that's a real thing and he's also just like and she sucks like she falls all the time and like we have to like stay on the bunny slopes because of her like i came here to have a good time i want to do like the real hills oh my god and then she overhears it and she's like you guys can go without me like i can just stay here at the lodge it's not a big deal and essentially they convince a ski lift operator to let them go on like one last run down the mountain before the resort closes for the week because there's a storm coming Mm. and through like a series of events because they have kind of like duped this like operator into letting them go on for like less than buying a lift pass like they're like you're a cute girl go flirt with him and like tell him you'll give him cash if he lets us on Instead of, like, having to go pay the full price for a lift pass. So, like, they, they've they done this before. And so he, you know, he lets them go. And then he gets relieved by another operator. He's like, hey, there's still, like, three people up there. And then that operator sees three different people and is like, oh, good. Everybody's off and shuts down the lift. They are still on the lift above the ground. I take it this is a very tall lift. Yes. They are, like, going up the mountain. It is, like... It's not far enough to just wiggle and climb out and get mm-hmm. down. Like, they are 
above. Up in the air. I, you're bringing back like all sorts of, I was a bona fide ski club member from junior high all the way into high school. I did try snowboarding my last year, which is why I'm like, that's a real thing. Yeah. And that is terrifying. Like that is a terrifying thing to think about when you're on the lift so is what if it stops? The three of them up there, everything's shutting down for a week because of weather. So there's not going to be anyone out there to find you for a week. There's a snowstorm coming and right. you were out exposed to the elements a lot of feet above the ground. Yes. Even even like being 20 or 30 feet above is too high. It's too high. That snow yeah. is not, especially like snow during a snowstorm and it's cold. Like it's not, it doesn't feel good to fall yeah. on. It's not powdery and like, oh, it's a Disney movie. Like, no, you're going to get messed up from it. Yeah. And so like they're like very quickly, like the storm hits and they're just like trying to cover their face because it's just like sleet and ice is hitting Ugh. them. And like pa- or, um, Parker, the girlfriend, like drops one of her gloves. So she only has one glove on. No. And that's Pocket why your fingers, I am going to say this because it's like the grossest thing to me in this whole movie. And I wish someone would have warned me about it. There is a scene where she falls asleep holding the safety bar and wakes up and has to peel her like frostbitten Ooh. hand off of it. And it takes chunks of her skin off. Um, there's like other things with frostbite in this as well. That's there's yucky. Some they have to make these like life or death decisions to decide like how they're going to survive. And I'm not going to say, like, who these things happen to, but, like, there are situations they get put in where um, there are, like, wolves involved that are, like, roaming around. It's on, Um, uh, every time I flip through stuff, I think it's on Amazon Prime right now for streaming. Yeah. And it always shows the scene with the wolf, there's, like, a wolf growling, and it's like, oh, no. Yes, there's (sighs) wolves, there's, um like pretty graphic broken bones that are like poking out of people's bodies and it is essentially the story then of how any of them survive so yeah this okay there's like another part that when they're still on the lift like before everything is happening um and parker has that like sort of existential moment where like you're just kind of accepting that you're gonna die and she's like she has a puppy and she's like she's gonna be so confused she's not gonna know that I died she's just gonna think that I abandoned her and she's not gonna know why I didn't come home and she's gonna be so hungry and there's no one there to feed her and they're like no 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 like your neighbors will hear her barking they'll break down the door and feed her she'll be okay (laughs) that's so sad yeah it was deeply upsetting Because that's, like, how my brain works, where I think I'm, like, oh, my God, if something happened, like, Obi, my cat, would not know what happened to me and, like, would just think I abandoned him. Oh, God. So, yeah, it is, like, it's, it's like, pretty panned. Like, people think it's a terrible movie, but I, it is, like, that 2000s era, like, the aughts into the 2010s era of horror movie of just, like, it's kind of a shitty movie, but it's kind of fun anyway. That's, like, most of the movies in that era. Yeah. That was just the vibe then. It was either that or, like, super duper violent remakes of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. I'm kind of saving my those two I want to talk about for the end. Do you want me to do another one? um, Well, no. I have more. I have more. So, the one I'm going to talk about is, it's gross in concept. And I think about this because uh, I did not grow up a lot with my mom censoring what I watched. Um, So I saw this when I was little and I remember it. And I remember afterwards, it was me, my mom and my grandma. My grandma's like, what did we just watch? (laughs) And um, the movie I am talking about was made in 1999 and it is called Ravenous. I know this one. Yeah. And it is considered a horror western cannibal film. And it stars Guy Pierce, Robert Carlyle, Jeffrey Jones, and David Arquette. And for those of you who are like, what is this movie, Beth? First of all, it had like, it had a lot of different things happen to it. It, it had issues with the budget and shooting schedules. And the original director was fired three weeks into production. Dang. 
and then he was replaced and the film score was actually the only thing that was like hey this is okay because it's a quirky and inventive use of loops instruments and musical structure and it's based off of combined elements from the Donner Party and the real life the Colorado cannibal Alfred Packer, who survived by eating five companions after being snowbound in the San Juan Mountains in the 1870s. And the film's plot is also considered a overt criticism of Manifest Destiny through its use of cannibalism. So the basic plot is that this is set kind of during the 1840s, during... Uh, and you start with uh, John Boyd, who's second lieutenant. He's in the Mexican-American War, and he essentially runs away from battle. And by running away from battle, he inherently puts himself in like a good position that he like wins the battle and captures like somebody from the opposing side in the Mexican-American War, and he gets like a medal for it. But then his like superior officer finds out he was there because he ran away and they were like "Mm, okay and they they got mad at him so they actually exile him out to fort spencer which is a remote military outpost high in the sierra nevada commanded by the weary but genial colonel hart and staffed by a motley array of misfits the pious uh private toffler the drug addict private Private Cleves, the drunken Major Knox, and ferocious uh, Private Reich, in addition to Native American Scout George and his sister Martha. So, essentially, this guy gets there, and a stranger, John Boyd, gets there, and a stranger arrives, and he essentially talks about how the stranger arrives, and he talks about how he was reduced to cannibalism, but he he alleges that it was actually it was more like murder it wasn't cannibalism <laughs> and um and then one of the one of the members of the thing warns about a myth of i won't say it cuz we we're a little stitious here <laughs> about a creature uh in the west primarily oh, is it the w yes okay um that anyone who consumes the flesh of their enemies takes the strength but becomes a demon cursed by an insatiable hunger for more human flesh which upon reading that all i could think about is the always sunny episode <laughs> that which you have consumed <laughs> that which you have just eaten is human meat. <laughs> nah, that was raccoon meat. It's probably riddled with parasites. <laughs> so they go to investigate kind of this stranger's claims and go to the cave that the guy said he was stuck in and they think they find stuff. And essentially, the tensions become high. Like, it is this Sierra Nevada mountain, so it is snowy, it is winter time, and they are kind of forced to deal with this guy of like is are are they actually can is he actually a cannibal is he not a cannibal and like is it true and it's a very like very psychologically tense movie i do remember that and then guy pierce is the main character david arquette is also in this which i don't really remember but i'm like oh that kind of makes sense and It doesn't end well, which is also, I think, why my grandma said, what did we just watch? Yeah, it's it's a movie about cannibalism. And like, what would you do if you were faced with like being kind of in these extreme, like in these extreme situations of like no food and being trapped for the winter? So if you're interested in that, I'm not saying you're interested in cannibalism, but if you're interested in movies that kind of pits man versus man and kind of like you know do you succumb into temptation do you succumb into um these wilds or do you like use different ideas of like how to survive these situations like how you know how would you survive this situation if that's something that you're like interested in or if you're interested in like historical horror which i feel like you don't really see a lot now like you used to um especially like this is in the 1800s like then yeah, give this a try. It has a bit of a cult following. It did not do well at the box office. It was critically and commercially panned. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to watch what is considered a bit of a cult classic in, in horror now, like, give this a follow. I, I've i only watched this once, but I was like, oh, I do remember that. And I do remember Winter being a part of that. 
So yeah, if that's something you're interested in, give it you know give it a watch, and I guess let me know what you think of it. I have not rewatched this because I I remember enough of it in rereading the plot. I was like, oh yes, I do remember watching this. So it must have struck some sort of nerve in me, and the stew scene itself, where I'm like, it looks so good because it, it's so cold and it's so wintry, and you're just like, oh no, don't eat the stew, don't eat the stew. But then you're like, man, I get it though, because that looks really good. <laughs> okay. You you know what is in the stew, right? I know what's in the you stew. can guess what's in the stew. I know what's in the stew. Tofu. <laughs> Terrifying. No. Okay. Uh, so my next one is the Black Coat's daughter. Have you seen this? I have not seen that one. It's um another supernatural psychological horror. And it stars Emma Roberts, Kiernan Shipka, Lucy Boynton, Lauren Holly, and James Remar. And like James Remar. The plot is split into like three timelines. So the first two are Rose and Joan, and they kind of overlap. And then the third timeline, Cat, comes in at the end and sort of wraps it up. So it is set in February. And it takes place at a prestigious Catholic boarding school in upstate New York. And all of the students are about to be picked up by their parents for a week-long break. And Kat, played by Kiernan Shepka, is a freshman. Rose, who is uh, Lucy Boynton, is a senior. They're like kind of left behind in the office and they're trying to figure out what to do with them because they're like we can't just like stay here over break like you can't just live here like we'll have to keep trying your parents but like everyone else is leaving the headmaster does not want to like stick around so it's (laughs) like these two girls and like the nuns left there rose intentionally has stayed behind she has her reasons which you find out very early and she sort of like fibbed to her parents on when her break starts (laughs) So that she can buy some time. And Kat has had sort of like a premonition of why her parents may not be there to pick her up. Okay. And um, while they are there, like, strange things are happening. So, like, Kat starts to become, like, very sickly and is, like, acting out of character like the, it's very like every movie that has like some sort of like possession oh, situation okay. in it you're like oh man like something is not right with her like things are very bad so that is like one storyline that's happening um there is like a horrific murder that happens uh that the police get involved with and then you get, like, a second storyline, which is Joan, which is Emma Roberts. And she is at a bus stop after she escaped from a mental institution. Mm. And she gets picked up by an older couple, which is um, Lauren Holly and your guy. And they um, offer to give her a ride. And they're kind of, like, explaining who they are and, like, why they're going, where they're going. And she's just kind of, like, along for the ride. And you know that she is, like, on the run. And you see that she has a scar on her shoulder, but it's not totally explained. So you're like, what's going on with her? And then the last storyline comes in. And you sort of get to fill in the blanks then of what has been happening. And holy shit is it wild (laughs) um this is one that i was like i did not put it together until the end and was and then i was like oh my god like how how did i not get that that was what was happening and it it there's like lots of very snowy outside scenes like there's one scene where one of the nuns is like go shovel the road down to the ground (laughs) the headmaster is returning and so you know like it's it's very isolated in this boarding school they're like kind of trapped there with this like weird paranormal presence that is like wreaking havoc and Kiernan is just incredible in like everything so I was gonna say I feel like because she started like what Mad Men yeah and I feel like since then she's like 
all right, you think I'm like a kid, but I'm going to yeah. be in a bunch of horror movies and you're not going to expect this range from me. Yeah. And she just kind of like became like a horror girly. Like she's Sabrina and, and then Emma Roberts as well with like American Horror Story and stuff like that. But and um, Scream. And Scream. Yeah. All of those things. So this one is also, it's also known as February, but I've only. I have only ever seen it called The, the Black, Black Coat's Daughter. Daughter. Yeah. Um, it is available for streaming right now on a couple different platforms, so easy to find. Um, Before my two big ones, I think we both talked about this one, but I wanted to talk about We Are Still Here. Did you get to watch that one? Yeah. Okay. I So <laughs> I very much remember this was made in 2015. Um, it's written and directed by Ted Georgiohagen Georgiohagen oh, I, I think it's Geogen Geogen okay um but it stars Andrew Sensing and Barbara Crampton which you know happy belated Barbara Crampton she is a very i would say a very predominant 80s uh scream queen horror icon so it it's nice to see her in in movies um she's in this and you're next so i saw those pretty close together but it's about this couple who move to a new house after the death of their son and they move to this like very small town in this pretty isolated it's very bleak it's very wintry it's set in like the late 70s so it, it's very it feels like it was made in the seven. I think they do it well, where it feels like it's it is made in the era it's supposed to be set in. Yeah, like the the cinematography, it's like very desaturated, mm -hmm. so it like looks like that like late seventies film. And it's uh, essentially they move into this house, and weird things start happening, and they are told by their neighbor that they need to leave the house, that it's they should not be there. And then they have, like, two friends who are, uh, like, seance, like, reader, like... I think they're supposed to be, like, Ed and Lorraine Light. Like, they're, they talk about them, like, smoking pot, but they're mm -hmm. also, like, like, sensitives and mediums. Yeah, yeah. And they, like, you know, have, like, dealt with stuff like this before, but they're like, don't say that, don't make them feel weird about it. So they have these friends that are supposed to come over and they're like, we will like essentially do like a reading type of seance to like talk to your, cause they're trying to get over the death of their son, which happened very suddenly. And instead they find out in their house that it is not haunted by <laughs> their son. It is haunted by a bunch of other ghosts. And I just, one of my favorite things is I use Letterboxd to, like, log all of my, like, viewing, and I love stats and stuff like that, but one of my favorite things is to read other people's Letterboxd reviews, because some of them are just so unhinged, and this one, I just have to read it. This is from Nathax, N -N -E. it's, I think it's supposed to be, like, Nathan or something like that, N-A-T-H-A-X-N-N-E, Okay. They they rated it four stars, so keep that in mind. Okay, solid. That's a solid review. Out this of five is four stars. out of five. A horror comedy, black as smoldering pitch, flaking off and getting weird. I didn't know what I was getting into with We Are Still Here until more than two thirds through. Same. Yes. Wavering tone, unstable commitment to ethos, design, acting quality. Fair. Jolting, meditative. It was a weird ride, but then it all clicked. This is like a super extended Saturday Night Live skit if SNL decided to give up the ghost and move into the horror movies of circa 1980. The Changeling, The Shining, The Amityville Horror, The Fog, The House by the Cemetery, and or The Beyond. Put some folks in semi-dodgy retro gear, give them a damn territory full of dark, chthonic gods, a bunch of shitty town folks, and pissed off ghosts who've been on fire for over 100 years, and you have the funniest American horror comedy in I don't know how long. <laughs> Honestly, this feels more like a New Zealand-style picture, but even a little more under the radar. But as the film went on, the more and more I realized, this is funny! There's no way this was not meant to be hysterical. 
Larry Fessenden is a blast channeling Jack Nicholson the way John Belushi channeled Joe Cocker. Barbara Compton has dialed so far down on her dry wit, she is playing it near straight. <coughs> Kareem Hussein's photography is amber and burnished and crackling, a low winter sun through the trees, like a whiskey commercial with a super awesome fireplace or the big chill or ordinary people if what haunted those movies was more than just ridiculous turtlenecks. This is a movie I can't wait to see again. I wish I drank B&J. I would have some to pour out for my spectral visitors. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's not, I feel not like that has the like mark. encompassed all of my thoughts. Uh, yeah, not off the mark. The movie has a bit of a slow burn quality to it up until two thirds of the way through when you're just like, oh, God, what is happening? Um, and I can't tell you exactly of just the basic premise, because if I tell you anything more than that, it, it spoils what happens two thirds of the way through. The ending is worth it, though, as a horror fan. If you're like, no, oh, man, only a chair glided across the floor. That's so boring. Listen, just it's like an hour and a half. It's like it's not it's a long like, movie. It's like intentional that it's like as soon as you are lulled into this false sense of like, oh, man, what a stinker. Then it like is like the Dolby surround sound commercial where it blows you back in your chair. Yes. and Your hair goes flying. Yes. It gets so bonkers. Yes. And I as I said, we actually bought this, which is wild. Like I had no me and my husband were at Target, and it was on display. That was back when Target actually sold more movies than it does now, like, than the aisle it has now. Yeah. And we saw this, and we saw the cover, and it's a very distinctive, like, cover. And I was like, I, he must have read about it, because he immediately picked it up and said, oh, yeah, I'll buy that for, like, ten bucks. And I was like, what is it? And he's like, yeah, we'll just watch it. And I'm like, okay. And then I was like, oh, okay, this is, and then it gets to the two thirds and I'm like, oh my God, what did I just watch? And I was like, you know what? That's a solid horror movie at the end. And then, and then go read that letterbox review again afterwards. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I have my last two, which I think you probably already know what I'm. I'm... Yes. I have notes on them, but I assumed you were going to talk about them. Yeah. So. Let me get rid of We Are Still Here, because that was my my finger bobber. So the next one is, <laughs> bear with me here, <laughs> it's a paranormal activity movie. Oh, oh, that's right. It's Next of Kin. Again, I said I chose these based purely on if there was snow. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did You saw this one in theaters, didn't you? I didn't see it in theaters, but I saw it, like, the day it dropped on Paramount+. Plus. Okay. It was actually a first date. We That's watched right. this. I remember that. <laughs> Which, honestly, great for a first date, because it's, like, it's that type of horror movie, and you just end up making fun of it. So, like, it's good. It's good for that. So, um, it's from 2021. A lot of people did not like this one because it strays from the format that like has already been established by Paranormal Activity. Like it is still quote unquote found footage, but it's not like that family in that house with like nanny cams and things like that. It is um the story of this girl Margot and her friend Chris who want to make a documentary about her past. So her mother, Sarah, abandoned her outside a hospital as, like, a baby. Jesus. And she has always wondered what drove Sarah to do that. And she essentially does, like, a spit-in-the-tube DNA testing type thing and connects with a relative. And he is, like, Amish on his rumspringa. Oh, and agrees to like take her back to the secluded community that he's from that is also where her mother grew up. And so they're like, let's go. Like, we will film this and we will like, you know, figure some stuff out, which if you know, like anything about countercultures like the Amish, you should know that like they probably would not be super welcoming to like a documentary crew Absolutely coming not. to stay with them. So 
it's safe. I'm not spoiling anything. It is safe to tell you that they are not actually Amish, but they do live this like secluded life. Um, they do like have pretty similar like rules to how they live their life like you know there's not a lot of mirrors because they want to avoid like vanity they um live like very simple lives with like minimal to no electricity so you're in like a snowy remote area everything's kind of like lit by candlelight at night or by like oh let me turn on my cell phone flashlight or let me open up the camera and record some things and while they're like exploring this area that they live in, they find this sort of like abandoned church away from everything. And they are warned not to go in there or go near it. And so of course they like go back and they like break in. Cause well, what else yeah. would you do in a horror movie? There's like a weird, weird scene with a newborn, like two headed goat or calf that's born and cool. is sacrificed. Oh. I mean, it goes off the rails in exactly the way you expect it to with a paranormal activity movie. But there's like one specific scene I am thinking of that is like happening outside during a snowstorm. And I usually like I hate jump scare type things. And so these movies, like I have to watch them like through my fingers like with my hands over my face or like covering like part of the mm -hmm. screen and just looking at the bottom because I just know that like if you see too much of the background like something's popping up back there right and this guy is like outside in the storm and the camera's pointed at him and behind him you see something like coming up out of the dark it's so scary <laughs> it's so scary and like you know it's coming and there's nothing you can do about it so I think it has, like, decent horror movie elements that are, like, tropes from other genres of horror that are not necessarily in the rest of the paranormal activity movies. It's not, like, going to blow your mind by any, you know, sense of, of this. But it is, like, kind of just a fun, like, I just want something to watch on, like, a Friday night while we eat a pizza and, like, we can kind of joke about it horror movie. And it's got real strong snowy winter vibes. <laughs> oh, we're, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. And you, at this point, you guys have been with us for a while. And you're probably like, why have you not mentioned one movie and two movies? So I'm going to mention these two. We are, we are really, the last three movies of this are all the same dude. <laughs> yeah. So the first one I'm going to mention is Misery. And um, this is, of course, a 1990 movie based on, directed by Rob Reiner, based on, which is not who you would expect to direct a Stephen King adaptation. But he did Stand I know, he by did me. Stand By Me. But he loves Uncle Steve. He loves Uncle Steve. But this is based off of Stephen King's book, which, if you haven't read this book, I would highly recommend it. This is actually one of my favorite Stephen King books. And it is about a writer... Uh, Paul Sheldon, who just gets finished, he he's in Colorado. He books this hotel where he writes his stories, and then once he finishes, he like leaves and then sends it to his publisher. He just finishes writing uh, this new manuscript he has for. He just finishes writing this new manuscript. He he's very famous for this series called the Misery series, and it's like a like a historical kind of They're romance like Victorian romance yeah. novels yeah um with you know some other elements in it but so he's like trying to get away from that as a writer and he's driving and he's driving this like little sports car and it's snowy and he gets into a car accident and he he gets into a very bad car accident like flip his car like off the side of the road you're not going to see it and immediately he is rescued and he is rescued by this woman who looks from the outside very kind of matronly but warm and like you are like okay he's probably gonna be okay and you find out that she is a nurse uh named annie wilkes and she he like loses consciousness and he wakes up and then he's in her and in, in her house in a bed 
and he can't move his legs because he essentially broke his legs in this car accident. And she saved him literally from dying because of where he fell on the side of the road, he would not have been found. Cue the winter. He is literally, they are both stuck in Annie's house and his car is covered by inches of snow because it's Colorado and it snows a lot in the winter. What we find out pretty shortly is that Annie is his biggest fan. I'm your number one fan. And uh, it's very much a game of cat and mouse because once he starts to get better, he he thinks initially that help is on the way, that he's going to get rescued and stuff like that. But he shortly realizes after that that's not the case. And he is kind of stuck there and he thinks he's going to be stuck there forever like I may die here and Annie is not what she seems she seems like she might be a very unassuming woman Uh, she's played by Kathy Bates she won an Oscar for this movie like she is excellent in this movie and Paul Sheldon is played by um, James Caan. James Caan. But do you know all the people that were offered that part before him? I do not. They really wanted William Hurt who oh, I think would have been okay. great. Same vibe. Then Kevin Klein, Totally different vibe. Oh. I think it still would have been good, but it would have been different. Yeah. Michael Douglas. Interesting. Harrison Ford. Oh, I don't I don't like that. I do. I I, I know. really like that. I know you like Harrison Ford. Uh, I don't know if I Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> Robert De Niro. Al Pacino. Oh Richard Dreyfus. Also would have been good, but different. Mm -hmm. Gene Hackman would have been great. And Robert Redford also would have been great. Uh, Yes. They all turned it down. Warren Beatty really wanted it, but they didn't like his take on the character. I, having read the book, feel like it is extremely well casted. Actually, the book... Um, the audio version I read, the woman sounded a lot like Kathy Bates, and I was like, that is very strange that you found a woman that sounds so similar to her. Um, the book, so the movie is actually, there are some pretty horrific scenes in this. It's very cat and mouse, uh, most of the movie, where you're like, is Paul Sheldon ever going to like get the best of Annie Wilkes like this he's trapped in her home how is he gonna how is he going to escape like you root for him like the entire time I will say the book does give Annie a little more depth I mean as you but she Kathy Bates does such a good job portraying her one that you're like specific injury that is like way worse in the book yes. too yes i don't want to mention it i'm, I'm not gonna mention anything. it it is an iconic scene in the film so if you've seen gifs or anything of it yeah. it's probably of that scene they also this is like i have to go off on this like whole because this whole weird casting thing because it's i think that that's so interesting we're like knowing all these people and i'm like i think they also would have been good but it would have been like a very it would have felt mm-hmm. like a totally different movie they also offered the role of annie to angelica houston whoa that complete which annie in the book like listen we both love uncle steve but he does have his issues he's Mm -hmm. not a perfect author he describes annie as being like a bigger woman so angelica houston is not who i would have pictured as yeah they offered it to angelica houston and bet midler completely different yeah i don't i don't know i don't know if that would have been i think she is just unhinged enough that it would have worked Maybe, maybe. I have I, you ever seen her singing Auto Titsling and Beaches? <laughs> no. Like she's got that vibe. I'm thinking it's like the the like mm, first wives club energy. Bette Midler is very similar to Kathy Annie Wilkes. Um, but that's yeah. When you first meet Annie, that's what I like is she is the most unassuming woman, and even on screen, like. She is the type of, and I think Kathy Bates has kind of just rolled with this because I know she's played like a similar vibe in like Bride Green Tomatoes of like, she is this like plus sized kind of, she's not what I would describe as inherently beautiful or anything like that. She's not ugly, but she's not, she's an average looking she's woman. She's not what Hollywood's like leading lady yes. stereotypes are. And so she is, she is the type of woman that you probably pass over in the crowd 
she wears in these she wears very very homey like turtleneck matronly turtlenecks with like button ups over it with either jeans or an overhaul skort type thing going on with big boots because again it's Colorado um the winter time very much has something to do like he can't leave because it's snowy out and she's like we can't even get out of the roads they're impassable right now um so all of that is hindering things like phone lines are down so he can't even like get on the phone at some point because one at first it's like phone lines are down but then two you find out that annie has cut the lines but it is such a good cat and mouse game and if you are creative and you've written any stories or anything like they do a really nice job in describing creative writing process especially in the book but they do describe that in the movie as well and I just feel like it's like a perfect movie that encapsulates the winter season, like both the highs and the lows of the winter season. You know who else has played Annie and what's his butt? There's there's a stage adaptation oh, of this. Oh, gotcha. And um, Lori Metcalf, oh. who's Aunt Jackie from Roseanne, played yes. Annie. Yes. And Bruce Willis played paul sheldon oh yeah i would be i would like to see that laurie metcalf is one of the most overlooked talents in like acting in general theater film and tv she always gets relegated to these like side characters she's so incredibly talented like she blows my mind (laughs) the end I just thought about that because, like, when when this movie when they cast Kathy Bates, she was really only known for like her stage acting mm-hmm. at that time. Like, this was like the first movie that really put her out there, and she won a freaking Oscar for yeah. it. Yeah, and if you've ever seen it, like, as I said, Rob Reiner, like, you think Princess Bride, you think Stand by Me, and you then, think like, co- yeah, comedies, like, kind of feel good esque yeah. movies, and then you have Misery. It's yeah, it's just excellent. So I'm gonna cruise right along with uh with Uncle Steve continuing into the second of our last three here, and that is Storm of the Century. I have not seen this one, and I was like, I'll read the book of it. There's not a real book of it. It's that just is the, the real book of it's it. The it's the screenplay it's only because it wasn't a book. Right. It was written as a screenplay. Like he literally calls it a novel for television. And so they published it as a script rather right. than prose, like right before it came out. So like that is the only way to read it. And I still think it's worth reading. Okay. I'll it's keep that in mind. For sure worth watching. It is it was a made for TV miniseries. So it's three episodes essentially. Mm-hmm. It's only about it's like four and a half hours if you watch all of them. So like you can break it up over chunks. It is Stephen King says that this is, like, his favorite film adaptation of, like, anything, and it's probably because he wrote it for, like, TV. You know. <laughs> it's, like, of all my stuff, it's, like, this and then Misery are, like, my favorites. So, which is so funny with the one we're ending on because he fucking hates it. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> Storm of the Century is essentially um, the story of Little Tall Island in Maine, and they are preparing for a blizzard in 1989. And so you're already isolated on an island and Little Tall is mentioned in other stories like Dolores Claiborne and things like that. So this is already established in the world of King. And so the residents of this island are kind of like battening down the hatches. They're stocking up on food. Um, One of my favorite quotes to like when I was learning like dialects, you would always have like a cue sentence that had all the right vowel sounds in it to like get you into an accent. And my favorite one for like New England and Maine is the one that I stole from this line because at the very beginning somebody's like, "Haven't you got any regular hamburger, Michael Anderson?" <laughs> and so there, yeah, it's great Maine accents per usual. And as they are all sort of like settling in and hunkering down, um, one of the elderly residents, Martha Clarendon, is brutally murdered by a stranger. Oh, played by Colm Fior, who has like the most bad guy face of any bad guy ever. Like he hold on, we're going to bring him up. (laughs) 
Oh, yeah, 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 he does. And he's walking around with this, um, like, a walking stick cane with, like, this creepy, like, steel head on the top of it. Ooh. So, and he's wearing, like, a little fisherman's cap and, like, a turtleneck. So he's, like, kind of blending in, but it's also the kind of small town where everybody knows everybody. And they're like, who the fuck is that guy when they finally see him? Essentially, like, they... Mike Anderson is, like, the owner of the supermarket, played by Tim Daly, who's just, like, such a, like, from, when did this come out? It was, like, 1999. Very, like, TV dad at that point. Good-looking TV dad. And he is, like, a part-time constable as well, so he's, like, helping investigate this murder. And they arrest the stranger, who identifies himself as Andre Linoge, and he somehow knows the names of Every single person who lives on Little Tall, all of their deepest, darkest secrets, and is super interested in Mike's son, Ralphie, who he has a birthmark on his nose and they call it like a fairy kiss. Mm -hmm. And so he just keeps telling them, give me what I want and I'll go away. And while he's locked up in jail, more people are getting like murdered and terrible things are happening and they know he's behind it, but they can't figure out how they also can't figure out what it is he wants so when they finally do determine what he wants it's of course awful and it really is as simple as as soon as he gets what he wants it's all over (laughs) so it is um it is a very interesting take on like the dynamics of when you live in such close proximity with people and like what people are willing to do to keep their secrets right and like the kind of secrets that happen in places like this and how how willing are you to go into that trolley experiment where you divert the trolley and you kill one person but you saved four of them or do you just let it run over everyone mm. like you know so it it's a snowstorm so it's very new englandy and like really creepy scenes of people trying to go outside with like low visibility and again lots of blood spatter on the snow Uh, A lot of great sweaters (laughs) in this movie. I do love a good sweater. Also, Spencer Breslin's in it. Do you remember Spencer Breslin? Uh, He's Abigail Breslin's older brother. Yeah. He's Curtis from the Santa Claus movies. Okay. He had, like, that cute little lisp. And he was in, like, The Kid with Bruce Mm -hmm. Willis and all those things. He's in it as, like, one of the kids in town. Jeffrey DeMunn is in it. That's this guy who ends up being, like... Oh, he's literally like got the look of like, um, like I got bit by a zombie, but I'm not going to tell the rest of the group until mm-hmm. I'm about to change. Julianne Nicholson's in it. Becky Ann Baker's in it, who I freaking love. Like everything that she's in. She's I love her. Steve Rankin, Adam Lefebvre, a lot of like familiar faces of character actors that you'd be like, oh, yeah, that person. Mm-hmm. So I think it still holds up to. Like, for being made in 1999, like, the visuals, I think, are still pretty decent. And it still has, like, a Rotten Tomato score that's, like, oh. essentially, like, a 7 or 8 out of 10. So, nice. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, last but not least. Uh, and- bum, 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 yeah. Bum, 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 how could we, we not mention Winter Horror without mentioning this movie? It is, of course, The Shining. It's The Shining. Do you want to get seen? <laughs> directed by Stanley Kubrick, and and directed by Stanley Kubrick in 1980. And um, this movie, of course, is based off of the Stephen King novel by the same name. It is considered by Stephen King one of the worst adaptations, though he's kind of lessened up on that as. The time has gone by. I I get it because it is very different in, in tone, a lot yes. of ways yes. than his story. And I I am of the I am of the few people who I really love the miniseries version of it because it is closer to the book, and a lot of people hate it also because of like terrible CGI at the time, and a lot of people hate the kid who plays Danny in that. But that's a story for another time and place. Yeah. Um. So. To me, the way I try to justify kind of after reading The Shining and like I really, really like The Shining as a book, but trying to justify kind of The Shining as a movie in my mind, I just think of it as like, 
I don't know. I just think of them as two separate things. Like I'm like, oh yeah, that's I think like you have to a play off of Stephen King. Like it's loosely inspired by Stephen King's it's, The yeah, Shining. The things that are horrific in the book are not the things that they focus on. It's like a totally different take on what is horrific. Yes. Um, and I think if you think of that, it's as a Stephen King fan, it's much easier to enjoy The Shining as a film. Listen, if you watch, he's my favorite author. And I love this movie. I hate what Stanley Kubrick did to my girl during the filming of it. Yeah. But I love this movie. So, yeah. if I mean, this movie stars Jack Nicholson in it. It stars, oh my God, now I'm blinking. Shelley Duvall. Shelley Duvall as Wendy, who is his wife. Uh, Jack Nicholson plays Jack Torrance in it. Uh, Wendy plays... Or Wendy, Jesus. Uh, Shelly Duvall plays Wendy, Wendy Torrance. Um, and then Danny Torrance is their son. Scatman Carruthers is in it. Yes, and he plays... Gosh, now I'm He's like... Dick. He's, He's Dick. He's Dick Halloran. Dick Halloran. And the premise of this movie is that Jack Torrance is kind of a down-on-his-luck English teacher. He's had some issues with substance abuse and drinking, and he's trying to find a job, and he does finally find a job. They're in, like, a small suburb in Colorado, and he finds a job at the Overlook Hotel as the caretaker over the course of the winter. Um, now, he is told and very much fair warned that as the caretaker, it's just him, his wife, and his son up at this remote hotel and they will be snowed in essentially with no one with no way to get out and no way to get in. But yeah, everything have- is fully stocked and uh I mean it's not like it's it's fully stocked and stuff like that and it's not like it's you know they don't have anything like they have shelter, they have like they have like the they have a TV hookup. Yeah. They, the electricity is on but not all of the rooms are heated just like their living quarters are heated. But they have the run of the hotel and outside. They do have a snow cat. Yes. To help them get around on the ground. So, like, really, they could take that to the road, but just not a good idea in, like, a snowstorm. Right. So, I mean, immediately, Jack Nicholson has a very villainous face, so I think that doesn't help anything. It's, it's such an angular face, but it's also, and I don't know, maybe I'm being weird. It's also, like, he's, like, weirdly sexy. So, like, it's also disarming because, like, he has, like, a scary face, but also how much of that is because we know him from this movie. Right. It's very angular, but then, like, he also is, like, sort of charming. Yes, he is. And you see that kind of in the beginning of the movie, but if you've read the book, it's like, oh, completely different take on this character. So he gets this job. He is a writer, and he started out as, like, a teacher, and he lost his job just due to his alcohol consumption. So this is his, like, fresh start. Like, I will write my next great American novel. Like, you know, because there's only so much you can do once you're snowed in is essentially, like, he has to take care of the furnace and make sure the boiler doesn't, like, double over or anything like that. And like take care of the grounds and that's about it he has free time so he's like i'll work on my novel well upon getting there after he gets hired you find out like you meet dick who is the cook head cook there and he's leaving for florida for the winter um and he kind of has this interaction with danny and you find out that danny has something that dick calls the shining it's like telepathy it's like telepathy and he is like a special boy and he kind of has what we call premonitions he has like an imaginary friend named tony who tells him things he's the little boy that lives in my mouth that's he says that so many times and people are like who's tony he's the little boy that lives in my mouth uh i do want to say danny's got some great sweaters in this movie like love them he looks like a my buddy doll yeah He's got a great, like, sweater with, like, the rocket ship on it that says NASA. And I'm like, where did you get that? Mm -hmm. Um, Stylistically, this movie is, it's beautiful. And it is visually just stunning. There's so much to take in. There's so many iconic scenes. The carpeting is iconic. The 
like there's so many scenes of horror juxtaposed with like kind of the remote picturesqueness of the hotel. So upon being there, you know, Dick kind of warns kind of warns Danny and says, like, you might see stuff, but it shouldn't bother you. Think of it as like pictures in a book. Like it should not bother you. So they're like, okay. And then after he gets the job and he accepts the job, Jack Nicholson or Jack Torrance finds out that like bad stuff has happened here at this hotel and that one of the last caretakers murdered his family there. Um, and the, he's like, okay. So they, they get there and the hotel immediately kind of just empties out and they are just kind of by themselves. And after being in kind of the whimsy and the wonder of being like in this giant building by yourself, it's like, you know, we talk about like little kids in the library, like immediately as soon as they're in this wide space, they're like, ah, I gotta run around. Um, which is kind of the feeling they have weird stuff starts to happen little by little. And Danny sees the iconic like Brady twins there's a particular room that is like very scary that he keeps being drawn to. Um, Jack starts seeing a lot of weird stuff. And I don't think Wendy's really seeing as much. She's just kind of dealing with her two people that are like, yeah, acting I, funny. I mean, in, in this, in this version, like Wendy does not have like any, even in, like an ounce of the shine like no. she's just kind of living her life she's cooking the foods in the kitchen she's playing with her kid she's dealing with her stressed out husband like she's just there now they there is like a lot of like controversy about her portrayal of wendy in this like originally like i think they gave her like a razzie for like worst acting or right. something like that which then they rescinded because it did come out that like Kubrick was pretty abusive towards her on set, both emotionally and, like, he, like, intentionally traumatized her, to right. sum it up. So, like, they, they rescinded that, and, like, really, you know, she she plays Wendy as this very sort of, like, meek, submissive wife, which, like, th it, that exists in relationships, mm -hmm. um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but... I mean, what else would you expect, like, when you go through this, like, crisis of a relationship that she's going through in this movie and has, like, seen, you know, her husband be violent in, in other ways before they even get to this hotel? Right. Like, I mean, she lives in, like, a, a version of horror all the time. Like, of course she's terrified. Like, it's just become, like, much more visceral now. Right. But they also... Like, there's a scene where he's walking up the stairs talking to her, and he's like, Wendy, love of my life, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just going to bash your fucking head in. And, like, she's, like, freaking out and, like, flailing, and she's got a baseball bat. And when I was in college, my friend Adrian and I used to play this game where we would go, like, one, two, three, The Shining, and then we would have to, like, run from wherever <laughs> we were and, like, hit the walls, and we would just pretend to be Shelley Duvall's Wendy in this. Like, you had to drop whatever you were holding and just, like, oh, no. She has a baseball bat with her at that point, too. So, like, Wendy is very much, like, she has to deal with her husband who is just mentally deteriorating, which they try to, like, warn against. And then you have Danny who's also dealing with, like, these very creepy supernatural elements to it he does go like kind of catatonic at yeah. one point too so and my girl wendy's dealing with a lot leave shelly duvall alone and so she you know dealing with that and eventually they realize they have to leave the hotel and I, without spoiling the ending jack torrance the further he does like start to research kind of the hotel he finds like information as he's like exploring the hotel and he just has some sort of connection, which that's not done as much in the book. That's entirely like Stanley Kubrick's take on it, which I can very much understand. The, yeah, the ending of this movie is also like entirely different yes. than the book. So. It's uh, I would say it's darker than the book. It's it's got a really great score. The score yeah. is phenomenal to it, and it's I it is a you feel cold watching this movie it is isolating it is wintry you know there's not really any 
super blood on snow scenes and no. it's still but it's still a pretty bloody movie in aspects so it's it is an iconic <laughs> in, hor- in one, one aspect. aspect it is an iconic horror um, film for sure and i was watching this the other day just like i mean i've seen it a million times but i just wanted like a little refresh to see if there's like anything i wanted to talk about and like they i don't th- if they made that movie today, it would bomb. Yeah. I don't think it would do well in theaters at all. I think people would think it was like too tame compared to stuff today. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess yeah. I'm just thinking of like the scenes that so the scenes that scare me in The Shining as the book are completely different than the scenes that like spook me in the movie. Yeah. Um there's not many scenes that there's the only disturbing scene that truly scenes. scares me in the movie is in two three seven is in the room. yes yes that that scene is very spooky that's it um otherwise it's not it's not scary in terms of, it's more so disturbing because you you know jack is your main character and you are rooting for him to do the right thing and then as the movie goes on he keeps doing not what you expect him to do yeah i just i was like thinking about him like i can't even like i can't even think of who would make this but it would for sure suck and even if they didn't make it like that like if they tried to just do the shining now as a movie like it would be an entirely different movie like 237 would be like every five seconds you'd Mm -hmm. have shit popping up Mm -hmm. like the the Grady twins would be around like every goddamn corner and right. they'd probably be like ripping Danny's face off. Right. Like all of the chase scenes would be like way more intense. Yeah. And I'm just like, I I think that is a testament to that sometimes less is more. Like sometimes it is scarier when you can't see the monster. Right. I would also say, so if you are a fan of the shining but you're also a fan of stephen king stephen king and you like dr sleep is a sequel in both the movie format and the book so Mm -hmm. there is a book called dr sleep that is a sequel to the shining it's grown-up danny and mike flanagan has said that like he considers dr sleep the movie the adaptation of the book and he just wanted to carry over like small elements of the movie so it is much more faithful to like King's it, vision. It is of what very that is. faithful, but I thought it did a nice. It does a nice job being a sequel with the Overlook Hotel being tied into it. Mm-hmm. I thought it did a nice job of bringing them both together, where it's like a nice and and I know there's people who hated it for various reasons, but as a Stephen King fan, as a horror fan, I was like, oh yes, I thank you for paying homage to both of these in like a good term so yeah like of course we're going to talk about the shining of course it's like a perfect winter horror movie (laughs) so uh, you know where would we be if we didn't talk about that yeah there there is like a i mean i think it's kind of in like development hell and honestly i it can stay there for all i care but there was originally a spinoff called Overlook that got pitched at HBO Max. So good. And then they passed on it. Um, and then Netflix, I guess, like bid on it. And then they also passed on it. So now it's just kind of like floating out there looking for someone. Honestly, I hope it keeps floating. I don't really want it. But no, I don't want it either. Yeah. But Dr. Sleep, I was trying to find the quote from mike flanagan that i found earlier where he was talking about it but i don't think i'm gonna find it but i also forgot to mention that mike flanagan cites storm of the century as like a direct inspiration for midnight mass amazing so we are mike flanagan stands over here so we we worship at the church of mike flanagan yep and his wife kate (laughs) who can do no wrong in my eyes they're gonna be in cincinnati here in march uh, at a convention at the Horror Hound convention, and Eli Roth, and Sam Raimi, and Ted Raimi. I'm like, oh my god, nice. Do you think Ted's gonna sell um, condoms in the bathroom? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm just sad because 
as a mom now, I don't have excess money to be spending on autographs for everybody. No. I just, like, that's another, like, we brought this up before where I'm like, I just want to go to a Waffle House at 3 a.m. with them. And in right. Cincinnati, there's so many Waffle Houses. Yes, there are. That's my chance. I mean, the last time I was at a convention in that area, uh, the cast of The Walking Dead was there. And, like, everybody, that where that convention center is, everybody was, like, going to the immediate, like, restaurants around that. And my husband and I drove just slightly further away to an IHOP. Mm-hmm. Or no, it was a Bob Evans. A Bob Evans. And we saw the cast of The Walking Dead there. And we were like the only convention goers. And I'm like, oh my God, as I'm eating my like roast beef hash like sandwich, I'm like, he's, they're right there. Glenn is right there. And then, but like the waitresses, they did not care. Like they had no, like, it was just not something on their radar of like, I know who this person is. They were just people getting some pancakes, you know? So, yeah. Weird choice, cast of The Walking Dead. I mean, I would not have pegged you as Bob Evans people. (laughs) I'm like, I guess it's like the more upscale restaurant in the area that was like still kind of close. I just would have thought they would have gone to just like a restaurant, restaurant, not like a chain. Not a chain. I, they needed quick service so they could get back to I autographing. Guess. But yeah, so if you guys have any other horror movies that you want to share with us that we're like, how could you forget? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, let us know. Um, you know, I hope you enjoyed this spooky and cold wintry journey with us. And I hope it tides you over for, you know, the rest of our winter horror season. Until like March. Yes. Um, we'll see. We've had hit and miss snow so far in this section of Ohio. So I'm going to be so mad. It was like snowing earlier. and I'm going to be so mad if I go outside to leave and when we finish this and my snow is like covered in snow or my snow, my car is covered in snow. <laughs> I'm like, Beth, I'm not coming over anymore. <laughs> so yeah, if you guys enjoyed this, please let us know. And, uh, as always, we are the Lake Erie Library, and you can find us where social media is available, as in Instagram and Facebook, at Lake Erie Library. Uh, and you can also find us where podcasts are available. And are we working on anything else uh, in terms of social media right now? I don't think so. Absolutely not. No. We're, we're a little busy right now. But yeah. I hope you guys are having a good time. I hope you're not slipping and falling on the ice. And as always, stay spooky, friends. 